Um, I mean, I stand by my, my prediction uh, long term. Um, you know, that, that, that Tesla will be the most valuable company in the world. Tesla will be the most valuable company in the world. That is what Elon Musk just said December 22nd. So that was very recent. Just this month, he repeated his prediction again that he thinks his company Tesla will become the most valuable company in the world. Now, he's even made comparisons that he thinks it will become worth more than Saudi Aramco, more than Apple, and more than all these other companies combined. A massive multi-trillion dollar market cap company. And these predictions are ones that lots of people hold. We have Steven from Solving the Money Problem, a very popular channel on YouTube. He's basically all in on Tesla. That's been his portfolio for a long period of time. I think he's, he's done really well on it. And his prediction is that Tesla, like Elon Musk, it will be the most valuable company in the world with a multi-trillion dollar market cap. We have Jeremy from Financial Education just putting out a video, I think yesterday, where he gave his base case for Tesla, implying that it would have $50 billion of net income and again, have a multi-trillion dollar valuation. So I'm aware I'm surrounded by a lot of YouTube channels that are very bullish on Tesla. They think this company is gonna be massive. It's gonna be huge. They have lots of reasons to back that up. And that comes at a time where the stock is down big. It's down 72%. So naturally, a lot of people are asking the question, is this a good time to be jumping into Tesla? And I've asked the same question. I've come to a different conclusion. So I'm hopeful that in this video, I can share an opposing view about Tesla of why I'm not buying the stock without being labeled a hater. I don't have anything against anybody that's invested in Tesla. I don't think that they're dumb or stupid or anything like that, but I think it's good to hear opposing viewpoints with any company. And I think if you get into the attitude of only hearing viewpoints that reaffirm your biases, it can cause a little bit of an echo chamber. So in this video, I'm laying out why I'm not investing in Tesla, why I think this company has way more risk inherent in the investment than most investors are giving it credit for. I think it's a much riskier investment than most people realize. And this is something that I've done routinely and I hope these videos are valuable. I hope these different contrarian viewpoints are valuable. I've done something similar with Palantir. When it was trading around $30 per share, I made a video about why I'm not buying it. I think the company had a lot more risk. I think investors were too enthusiastic. I think they're predicting too good of a future for it. Palantir's at like six or seven dollars a share now. It's down 70%. During the peak of ARK Invest's hype, February of 2021, I made a video warning about ARK Invest, how I thought it would have low prospective returns. It's down 80% since that video. And so I like to make these opposing viewpoint videos because I think they can be helpful when you're doing research. And I think this one will be helpful to consider even if you're a Tesla investor, that would be the hope here. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We'll bring up Tesla here. And the big thing that's drawing attention to Tesla stock recently is both that the CEO, obviously Elon Musk is an attention grabbing person. Tesla is an attention grabbing stock. It's always been that way, but especially so over the past six months because of the breathtaking fall of the company. Now I've seen a lot of dramatic falls of companies. We've seen Meta, we've seen PayPal, we've seen uh, Netflix, we've seen a lot of companies fall, but none quite like Tesla because the size of this company was massive, a trillion dollar market cap, and it's down 73% year to date. And then if we look at it in just the past 90 days, three months, it's down 59%. If we look in the past month, one month, and it's down more than a percent a day, down 40%. This is a breathtaking, dramatic fall. And there's been a lot of finger pointing, people blaming Elon Musk, Elon Musk blaming the Fed, all right, the, you know, it goes on and on. People blame different things, but regardless, that is why people are focused on Tesla. Now, what does this fall do? Of course, it makes the valuation cheaper for Tesla. So people are wondering now if they should buy the dip for the company. And I think that question, that one question is reliant on one other question. The other question of whether or not you should buy the dip is reliant on the question, is Tesla a car company? This is an important question for Tesla investors. Listen to Gene Munster call in on the phone for CNBC. I think he accurately portrays this question. I forget which uh, of the panelists talked about this today, but is this a tech company or a car company? And I think that to me is the bigger question. If you think it's a car company, you shouldn't own it. Uh, this means that they're gonna have uh, minimal market share, that their margins will go away, that other companies are gonna catch up to them. If you think they have some sort of competitive tech advantage around manufacturing, whether it's FSD, batteries, um, that uh, will yield higher margins than typical, and there's a massive um, a market that they're getting into. So, Melissa, 80% of this is the vortex over the next month. 
I think the bigger question investors should be asking here is, is this a car or a tech company? If you believe it's a tech company, I think you should own it here, despite what the, the stock is trying to tell us. I think long term, it goes higher. And to understand why this question is so important of whether or not Tesla is a car company or a good tech company is because of the implications in those definitions. If you're to break down the differences between a good tech company and a car company, it looks something like this. Good tech companies have high returns on capital employed. They're typically asset light. They have high gross margins, high profit margins, high operating margins. They have reoccurring revenue. They're highly scalable. They also have high barriers to entry, large network effects. They have lock-in, creating a moat. This is what defines a good tech company. Now, a car company, on the other hand, is very different. Car companies are not good companies, period. It's not a good industry, not a good place to be. Car companies have low returns on capital employed that's also very sporadic. Car companies are capital intensive. They face intense competition. They're highly cyclical. They're sensitive to the economy. They sell a product that's not a reoccurring purchase. Rather, it's a one-time lumpy expense that the lifespan can be extended for years during economic slowness. Overall, car companies are bad businesses and they're different than tech companies. That is why they trade differently from tech companies. An example of this, a great example, is Ford, a car company. Ford trades at the same price it did in 1987, over 30 years ago. The only gains over that time period is basically the dividends it's paid, and that has not kept up with the market. Ford's earnings per share are not a compounder. They don't just continuously grow over time. Rather, they're highly cyclical and unpredictable. Ford's returns on capital employed overall are incredibly low, most of the time below the cost of capital. And more than that, they're also highly cyclical. This company never knows whether the investments it makes are going to be profitable. And again, the sensitivity to the economy, market cycles make this company overall with its investments very unpredictable. Even Ford's revenue is not very stable. It typically goes down a lot during recessions and takes a long time period to recover. Now investors realize all of these things with Ford and it's priced appropriately. Ford trades below a commodity multiple of a 12 Ford PE. That means that investors are literally pricing it as a wealth destructive company a company that does not create wealth above the cost of capital. They're pricing it at a seven Ford PE. So all of these various concerns with Ford, the cyclicality, the sensitivity to the economy, the low returns on capital employed, the historically bad performance are being priced into the stock by investors. It trades at a below commodity multiple with this seven Ford PE. It's a very low multiple. And Ford again is not cherry picking. It's not unique in this. This is the car industry. Companies like GM trade at a six Ford PE because they suffer from the very same thing. This is an industry-wide problem with these investments. Now, the big outlier here, of course, is Tesla. This company does not trade at a six or seven Ford PE ratio. Even after the dramatic 72% sell-off year to date, 50% over the past three months, the company still trades at a 28.8 Ford PE ratio, which is four times as much as GM and Ford. Four times the price for this company's next year's earnings. And that's what raises this big question of if Tesla is different than other car companies. Because if Tesla is the same, around the same as other car companies, it deserves to fall in price by another 70%. That's the implications there. So we have to show that Tesla is different than other car companies by a substantial amount to be trading at four times a multiple. So let's go ahead and jump into this question. Is Tesla different than a car company? Well, a lot of people attribute different attributes to Tesla. One of them that I heard really frequently six months to a year ago was unlimited demand. That was one of the biggest talking points from Tesla bulls. I've heard it over and over and over again. Tesla doesn't have demand issues. It sells as many vehicles as it can produce. It's only limited by the amount of vehicles it can produce. In fact, we have people with interviews one year ago that say this pretty explicitly. Here's one of the most notable Tesla analysts uh, who is Pierre. Um, they have unlimited demand so far, six months wait times for all cars. Unlimited demand so far, six months plus wait time. That's not a random clip. I'm not cherry picking here. I could find a dozen two dozen clips of people saying the same thing on CNBC, Tesla bulls saying the exact same thing. Tesla has unlimited demand, unlimited demand, unlimited demand. Now what's happened over the past year? Well, it seems like the unlimited demand thesis, that part of the thesis is starting to vanish. It seems like there's a little bit of cracks in that unlimited demand. Tesla shares are sliding on demand concerns. We have articles going back just a couple of months saying that there's a lot of price cuts with the Model 3 to try to make it so that they can sell their current vehicles. They're they're cutting down prices, which is a clear indication that they have a lower demand. 
companies don't lower prices because they have unlimited demand. Then we have other reports of Tesla not only cutting prices, but actually cutting output. So they're outright sizing down the amount of vehicles they're producing. Again, the only reason they would do this is because of demand issues. Now, even though you don't hear this part of the thesis as much anymore because it's starting to be it diminished a little bit, keep in mind this was a central thesis of many Tesla investors just one year ago. One year ago, the story of Tesla and why it was different than other car companies is it had unlimited amounts of demand. And we're just seeing that not happen. It seems like Tesla is starting to act and behave like other car companies with demand limitations, and it's starting to act like a cyclical company that's sensitive to the economy. We know what's going on right now. The situation has changed for the economy. We have the car dealership guy on Twitter that posts a lot about the car industry saying, imagine you're a 750 plus credit score rating, which is the highest score. Now imagine you come to buy a car and I offer you a 9% APR. Puke emoji. Rightfully so. Who wants a 9% interest rate on an auto loan? I don't need to say much more. High rates are killing the car business right now. They're crushing it. A year ago, the unlimited demand was closely tied to unlimited amounts of capital. You could get car loans for 1% or 2%. I have a loan for a car that is 2.1%. It's about as cheap as money can get. I, I get more in a savings account now. That's changed. That window of opportunity for all these car companies has vanished. The Fed jacked up interest rates so high, and it's going to take a while for them to come back down. And we're seeing this affect every car company, used cars, and the auto business as a whole. And what we're not seeing is Tesla being spared from these effects. We're seeing Tesla be affected by them with both price cuts and demand problems. We're seeing in the data itself, used car prices go down month after month after month. This does have an impact on the overall car industry. And I think a lot of investors are forgetting. If you can't get cheap interest rates on car loans and it goes from 2% to 9%, your car payment goes up dramatically. Most people can't afford that. They simply can't afford a thousand, fifteen hundred dollar car payment. They could afford a five hundred dollar one or a four hundred dollar one, but once it gets into the thousands, that is unaffordable for most families. And they're not going to be buying used luxury vehicles or new luxury vehicles when they can't get cheaper credit. Now, to add on to those concerns, that brings me to the next part. If Tesla is not a car company and it's a, a different company, a different entity, a really quality tech company, then it's not gonna be as economically sensitive as most car companies. But I don't know if that's gonna be the case. I really am unsure about that. I think Tesla may be about as economically sensitive to the economy as most car companies. Not only is it affected by interest rates, but economically sensitive companies have a wealth effect. We have home prices going down month after month after month. When home prices go down, it makes you feel poor. When you feel poor, you don't buy high-end premium vehicles. We have the stock market going down dramatically. The S&P 500 down 20 plus percent, the QQQ down 30 plus percent. That has a massive wealth effect. People feel poorer this year than last year. And again, if most people feel poor, most people are going to be more reluctant to buy premium vehicles. So I look at the whole situation here and I ask myself, is Tesla really that much less susceptible to the overall economy than most car companies? And I just don't know. But I think it's very risky and I think most investors are assuming that it's not when there's a good chance that it is, that it's going to be just as susceptible as most other car companies. Now we bring up the next point of the question, is Tesla another car company? One of the big moat advantages that lots of Tesla bulls have cited is that Tesla has a unique advantage with their gigafactories and with their manufacturing prowess. They basically are so sophisticated and so advanced with their robots and, and manufacturing process that they can manufacture these vehicles for a cheaper price, which raises their margins overall. And Tesla has gone to great lengths to sort of show off their, their advanced manufacturing with these really slick productions. Look at this video here. This is from the Tesla YouTube channel. By the way, I just find this stuff so amazing and fascinating what we're able to create. It is it is incredible. I have to give Tesla engineers and the robotic engineers, I mean, this stuff is just fascinating.
you know, I'm thinking about how they're filming this. Did they have some like world-class drone flyer in here just going in between the machines, hoping not to get stamped by one of them? Impressive. Th they got someone good with a drone here. I, I really think so. The Tesla Gigafactories and their manufacturing process is legitimately incredible. And I know why they would want to show this off, because it's incredibly impressive to show what they've done and what they've accomplished. But again, the question here is not if Tesla is impressive, but if it's different than a car company. Let's go ahead and look at another factory. This one happens to be by Ford. This is a walkthrough of a Ford factory by the YouTuber Jerry Rig Everything. And they invited him in. They don't have a fancy drone with an incredibly skilled pilot for that drone, but rather they just walked through and he filmed some of the process here. Now, it looks like Ford has like a different color schema here. A lot of it is this yellow and orange. But if you look at the robotics, I, I, think, it's, I think it's pretty neat what Ford was able to do. They have, similar to Tesla, these gigantic hydraulic robots basically assembling every single aspect of the car. In fact, watching this entire video, you realize how little humans are doing now. Now, not only does it actually assemble it and build it, but he goes on to describe how this little robot here with that camera goes around and takes pictures of all the different parts of the truck to make sure that every single component is in the exact right spot. And if it's off by one centimeter, they'll have a human come and inspect it and look at what's going wrong with it because uh, they can actually do the checking with robots and cameras. Then they move it, they move it along with this big robot here that that basically scoops the truck up and moves it along. And it goes through the assembly process. Humans do part of it. They just make sure the robots are doing their jobs. The humans do very little in and of themselves. And it, this is the process. When I looked through Tesla's Gigafactory, I think it is incredibly impressive. But then I look through Ford's factories and I think, again, they're incredibly impressive. And I think you should do the same, especially if you're a Tesla investor. Take a look at this video from Jerry Rig Everything. I'll put it in the description of this video. Watch the whole thing. It shows the entire process beginning to end and almost everything is done by robots. They eventually test the truck in case it has any leaks in any part of it. They actually spray it down with water just to make sure no part gets wet. And then after a test drive by an employee, that's when it's finally good to go. It's cleaned off and you have the Ford electric truck there. So when I look at Ford's manufacturing process and I see that it's also very impressive and almost entirely done by robots, I ask the question, is Tesla that much different than Ford even in the manufacturing process? Now, I'm no manufacturing expert. Maybe there's some differences I'm missing, but when I look at both the factories and the walkthroughs of both of them, it looks like almost everything in both factories is being done by robots, completely automated. And the big idea here that Tesla is entirely different than Ford because of the manufacturing process, I don't know. Again, it's something that I think is a little risky. I don't know how different they really are. To me, they look very similar. So we have the thesis part one. Tesla is different than a car company because it has unlimited demand. I don't really think that's the case. I think we're seeing that Tesla is more similar to other car companies with limitations to demand and economic sensitivity. Then we have thesis part two. Tesla is different because of its manufacturing prowess. Again, I'm not really seeing a huge difference there. Maybe I'm missing something, but they look very similar to me. Let's move on to Tesla thesis part three, full self-driving. Tesla's a tech company and not a car company because of its advanced full self-driving and the availability, the capability of their cars to be upgraded even after you buy them. So let's take a look together at the full self-driving. This is something that really would separate Tesla from any other car company. Now, luckily through the magic of YouTube, we have some content and some video footage on this as well. From Marcus Brownlee's channel, it's a great tech reviewer, one of the most popular ones, but he actually did a full self-driving full drive, like a 20 minute plus drive, on his way from his home to work, uh, where he, he films in his studio. And I really liked him doing this because I think that he gave a very transparent, honest review of this. I thought it was very straightforward and he describes the pros and cons of it. Now this is him on the freeway and he says that the, the best part of full self-driving, where it has it down best, is on the freeway. But he still describes the challenges with full self-driving. Get stressful. I'm gonna show you actually what it's showing me on the screen, which is, it's kind of picking a spot right now. Wow, that is assertive. That was an assertive move right there. Okay, 
that qualifies as assertive. So he's saying it's assertive. Tesla, it, it was trying to get into this lane. It needed to, so it really cut in in front of someone, a very assertive move. So he goes through this drive narrating it, and Marcus says repeatedly that right now, full self-driving would not be able to make this drive without his interaction, without him watching the vehicle. So even though it's called full self-driving, that's the label of it, it's not really full self-driving. It's, it's more like a helpful tool to drive, but you still have to be on guard watching the car in case it screws up. In fact, in one part here that we're gonna watch, this is where he had to actually interject and take over the car because it was about to do something he didn't want it to do, something that would not have been good. Which is like two to five and then five to two. Now it's going, this is not gonna work if it doesn't see that it's, yeah, there's, there's a, cone a cone here, it's not, yeah, like that. I'm taking over. So that was bad. There's a cone over there, I took over, and I also need to be back over to the right, which this car did not. Now he's having to cut like across a huge lane into the, the well second for. lane here. So I'm gonna go back into the correct lane here. Now again, I'm not trying to bash full self-driving. What they've accomplished so far is amazing, but this really isn't full self-driving. He has to be on guard and on watch the entire time he's making this drive. And in some cases, what I've heard from feedback from people I know personally that own Teslas, I have a couple friends and people that I work with that own them, they say that in some cases, full self-driving from Tesla is almost more stressful than just driving yourself. It's almost like having a student driver. It gets it right in most cases, but you still have to be on guard. You have to be ready to take over the steering wheel because they might make a dumb choice. And so you're almost on more guard and more stressed out than if you're just driving yourself. That's the feedback that I've often received. In either case, Tesla does not have full self-driving. Full self-driving would mean that you can punch in a location, you can recline in your chair, close your eyes, or you can recline and watch YouTube or Netflix and not even worry about the road. That's the true definition of full self-driving, Tesla simply isn't there. In fact, because the term full self-driving is a bit of a misnomer, it's kind of an overstatement for its capabilities, California has outright banned Tesla from calling it full self-driving, saying they cannot sell it under that label anymore. And that's one of their biggest markets. So the full self-driving aspect of Tesla is cool. I think it's very impressive, but I don't think it's a home run right now. It's not gotten to the last step of being totally, fully autonomous and not having anyone have to interact as it's driving. And at the same time, again, if we're asking the question between the Tesla and different vehicles, a lot of vehicles can aid drivers on the freeway. Just like the strongest point of full self-driving, there's many cars now that have cameras and sensors and they realign trucks, they realign cars if they're starting to go off the road, they warn about trucks, they'll automatically press the brake if you get too close to another car. I've actually seen that happen where a non-Tesla vehicle slams the brakes because a car in front of it is getting too close. Now this probably is not as advanced as Tesla by any means, but it is there. Cars outside of Teslas are doing some of these functions. Now again, the problem for Tesla right now is that if it's not full self-driving, then it's something other than full self-driving. And that has huge implications. Tesla cannot run a robo-taxi network. They can't have the massive economics implied in a lot of valuations unless they get to that end point where they really have fully autonomous, full self-driving. And at the same time, there's been a lot of predictions, a lot of promises from Elon Musk that this is right around the corner. This is back in 2014. Next year will probably be 90% capable of autopilot. Like, so 90% the Model S and Model X at this point uh, can drive autonomously with greater safety than a person right now. We're still on track for being able to go um, cross country from LA to New York by the end of the year, fully autonomous. But next year, for sure, we will have over a million robo-taxis on the road. I'm extremely confident uh, of achieving full autonomy uh, and, and releasing it to the Tesla customer base uh, next year. Tesla will solve level four FSD. I mean, it's looking quite likely that it will be next year. So Elon Musk has been making these repeated promises of full self-driving going back all the way to 2014. Every year, it's a year down the road, or by the end of this year, they're going to make the next big breakthrough with full self-driving. Here we are in 2022, almost in 2023, we have Marcus Brownlee driving his Tesla 20 minutes from his house to work, and he has to take over the vehicle twice, two times in 20 minutes. That's not close to full self-driving. It's impressive but it's not full self-driving. Now maybe he'll get it right next year and that'll be the year that it actually has full self-driving. But as of right now, with the data that we have, people drive Teslas. 
not the car. The car does not drive itself and people drive Fords. They drive Ford trucks. In both cases, people are driving the vehicles. People have their hands on the steering wheels. People are braking. People are looking through the windshield and making judgment calls. And even if the Tesla can do some things to aid in the driving, it's still people that have to be watching over it. They are legally mandated to make that happen. So again, looking back on all of this, I'm not trying to bash Tesla. That's not my goal here. I think it's an amazing company and I think it's incredible what they've accomplished. I'm glad the company exists. But when you're paying for a stock, you're paying a price, a a set price for the market cap. Right now, Tesla is a $350 billion company. And a lot of the thesis surrounding the implied market cap and these huge predictions about a multi-trillion dollar company, or in Elon Musk's words, the biggest company in the world, I, I think it's difficult to get behind it, at least for me. I don't see Tesla's having unlimited demand. I, I see them being affected by interest rates and being sensitive to the economy. I don't see Tesla's manufacturing process as all that different than competitors. I don't see full self-driving as really being full self-driving. I see it as something cool, but it's not autonomous driving quite yet. And I think the company's valuation implies something that I'm not seeing with the fundamentals of the company. And if Tesla is a tech company, we can compare it from not even car companies, but we can compare it to other tech companies. Let's compare Tesla to Adobe, for example. Adobe trades at a cheaper price based on next year's PE ratio. Even if Tesla outperforms and does $5 in earnings per share next year, higher than most analysts uh, expectations, Adobe's still cheaper. It still trades at a lower PE ratio. Adobe has a much higher free cash flow yield. So for the price you're paying for the market cap, you're getting a lot more actual free cash flows. Adobe has incredibly fast growing revenue, very Tesla-like revenue, but the difference is, is Adobe's revenue is almost entirely reoccurring. It's almost all subscription-based. Tesla's is off of large lumpy sales of vehicles, which are difficult to sell during economic slowness. We have Adobe's free cash flow, incredibly good, high free cash flow growth, and low amounts of stock-based compensation, similar to Tesla. But again, very good free cash flow growth while being subscription-based, and not having as much cyclicality. Adobe has been doing share buybacks while Tesla has been diluting the shareholder, issuing more shares. Adobe has higher returns on capital employed by quite a bit. Adobe has higher gross margins. Adobe has higher operating margins. Adobe has higher profit margins all across the board. And they're very consistent because again, it's a subscription tech company selling software. So I don't know what I'm missing here, but when I look at this, I'd rather just buy something like Adobe than something like Tesla. That's my thoughts for now. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think. See you in the next one.